Good morning. So 21 years ago, as I was starting medical school, um, I was at a welcome reception uh, with other uh, medical students, residents, and faculty. And a kind gentleman, he came up to me and started a conversation with me. And he asked me you know, what I was interested in. And um, I told him that I'm interested in pediatric transplant surgery, which was certainly the case um, at that point, and that I would love to engage in further immunology research, um, uh, which was certainly a, an interest that I had throughout my undergraduate years. And so his eyes lit up and he said, oh, I'm a transplant surgeon. Come to my lab, come to my OR, come and work with me. Um, so he handed me his card. And of course it was Dr. Oscar Salvatierra. So at that point, I had no idea of his amazing, amazing accomplishments and the pioneering work that he had done both in and out of the operating room. And so all I knew right then was that I had just met someone who took an interest in me and infused passion, enthusiasm, and kindness while maintaining his trademark humbleness that all of us know. And like for many of us here in the audience, he had been a mentor and a source of inspiration for me until he died in 2019. So Dr. Salvatierra early on helped to shape so many of my values, including compassion and the desire to help people, uh, people who are you know, different than you as well, authenticity, clinical excellence, and striving for the best for all of our patients, engaging in meaningful research, uh, education, and then also advocacy. And so just a little bit about my background. Um, so I'm half black, half Filipino. My dad is from Durham, North Carolina. When he was in the airports, he was stationed in the Philippines and that's where he, Met my mom. Um, I was born 1978. We traveled throughout the United States. We didn't live in any area longer than about two or three years. And as Michaela was saying, um, I'm Stanford through and through. I graduated um, from Stanford in 2000 with a major in human biology, focusing on immunology. And I came out as gay my freshman year of college and had largely positive experiences during that, during that time. I attended medical school here, um, uh, 2001 to 2007. Here's my, my study group. And we still continue to be very close friends um, up until this day. And we've all gone into different fields of medicine. So I took on leadership roles in several organizations uh, dedicated to increasing diversity in, in medicine, um, such as SNMA, the Student National Medical Association, which is devoted to increasing um, African-American representation um, in medicine, and also SUMA, Stanford University Minority Medical Alliance, which uh, held an annual uh, conference for underrepresented students. And I was also involved in LGBT meds, uh, which helped to coordinate their lecture series and bring about more awareness of LGBT related um, issues. So I also helped with admissions and reviewed applications and interviewed prospective students. And I really strove to keep an eye on diversity. And so for me during medical school, I had a broad array of interests, including basic science research and also teaching. Uh, but I, it was also very important for me to embrace the multiple facets of my identity and to maintain visibility and leadership roles. So for the most part, I had very positive um, and supportive experiences throughout college and medical school at Stanford. But as I started approaching residency in 2007, I could feel a little bit of a shift. Um, and I had concerns that my sexual orientation in particular could be used against me in some way. And so I was introduced, I remember, to um, a gay black surgeon uh, which I was super excited by, uh, by at that point because I never met another gay black surgeon, so a true unicorn. And I asked him for advice as I was applying um, into surgical residency. I was disheartened, but I suppose I wasn't completely surprised uh, when he told me not to reveal my sexual orientation to anyone. So at that point, I removed all my LGBT related activities from my application and I never mentioned my partner um, Harold during interviews. Um, I remember it was a plastics interview um, in Texas where I was asked if I were married, which of course is an illegal question uh, during the interviews. And I told the interviewer, no, I'm not married. And then he was happy with that response. And he said, good, then you'll have no distractions uh, during your training. That was his actual response. But little did he know the reason that I wasn't married was because it wasn't legal in California at the point, at that point, um, given the uh, passing of Proposition 8. So I was fortunate enough to match into the Stanford uh, plastic surgery program in 2007. And with Dr. Jim Chang as the chief of the division and Dr. Gordon Lee as a program director at the time, I truly felt well 
accepted and, and supported. And, and so did my husband, uh, Harold. And I met my now husband, Harold, right before medical school. And I remember how very nervous I was uh, bringing him to the surgery department uh, holiday party. It was my intern year. This is a picture of us. Um, and this essentially added us to, to everyone who didn't already know um, at that point. So as I said, my, my time as a resident um, was very positive, but there were certainly a kind of a sprinkling of, of encounters um, that left a, a bit of an indelible mark on me that I'd like to share with you. Um, and so regarding race, and I think many of you who are African-American can probably relate to some of these stories. So I was constantly mistaken, certainly for other black doctors. I remember even once getting into an argument with the nurse trying to convince her that um, it wasn't, um, that it was not me that they had just spoken with, but the other black resident, right? She just, she wouldn't believe me. Um, when I would enter patients' rooms, I remember I'd been mistaken for a transporter, an environmental service worker or a food service worker. So these are, of course, there's essential, you know, jobs. So certainly nothing for me to be ashamed about but it did highlight how difficult it was for people to even conceive of someone like me being a doctor. And I remember one time after giving a conference or giving a talk at a conference, an older white male surgeon came up to me. He congratulated me on a job well done. And he provided me this, this offhanded compliment by saying, given well, how well you speak, you're certainly not from the hood, are you? Um, and then regarding my sexual orientation, Okay, so on multiple occasions, I would hear the phrase flippantly used, oh, that's so gay. So particularly among heterosexual men is an insult to each other. And so one time a resident who had just said this out loud turned to me and said, oops, Thomas, oh, I, sorry, I didn't realize you were there. I forgot you were gay. So that was his form of an apology. Um, I remember putting in a Foley catheter once um, in a male patient and someone snidely said, oh, Thomas, it looks like you've had familiarity with that part of the male anatomy, right? And then this article here um, uh, on this slide, this was from the Mercury News in 2011. So this was after Harold and I found out that we owed thousands of dollars um, in bad taxes for health insurance coverage for, uh, for my husband since our status, at that point we were domestic partners, but our status as domestic partners wasn't recognized in Stanford let us know about four or five years um, into this. And so uh, we actually owed thousands and thousands of dollars in back taxes, unfortunately. And then just kind of one final story regarding um, my desire to go into gender affirming surgery. So I remember I was in the OR um, at Stanford. I was a senior resident. It was a combined case uh, with plastic surgery and then another service. Um, and there was an attending there. I never had met her before. And she asked me, you know, casually what I was going to be doing after residency. And um, I explained to her that I planned to pursue gender um, affirming surgery. And she stops what she's doing. And then she looks at me incredulously. And she says, are you serious? You're mutilating people. This is a waste of your education. Um, this completely goes against my Christian sensibilities. Right, your parents must be so ashamed of what you're doing. And um, this was shocking for me. It definitely caught me off guard. Um, but certainly at the time I felt powerless um, to say anything due to the fear of repercussion. So no one in the OR said anything, including me, and we continued to work. So these encounters certainly um, highlighted the lack of awareness and thought and just generally education. But they were frustrating to say the least, but they weren't impeding. And I was certainly determined more than ever to be a gender affirming surgeon. So Dr. Doug Ousterhout, who pioneered facial feminization surgery in the eighties, he gave this remarkable talk during a plastic surgery grand rounds, which was probably my third year of residency. And at that point I was hooked and I knew that I wanted to go into gender affirming surgery. Um, but I didn't know what route to take because there weren't any programs that were out there. I didn't really know of any surgeons who were doing this kind of work. So I brought my interest up to surgeons in the division. Um, and Dr. Dave Kahn actually introduced me to Judy Van Mazdam. She's a mental health professional here in Palo Alto, heavily involved in the community. And she was one of the early um, pioneers in WPATH. And she was a major, uh, definitely a major advocate in the community. And she took me under her wing. And she introduced me to Dr. Don Loth, and he was a, a prior chief of, chief of plastics at, at Stanford. And he had also been a, certainly a pioneer in the world of gender-affirming surgery and also in international health. 
So both of them had been mentors for me um, throughout my um, residency, and they guided me along in the process. And then ultimately went to uh, Miami Children's Hospital under the tutelage of Dr. Wolf, and he really helped to lay the foundation for a lot of the work that I do in facial surgery. Our son, Alexander, was born right before I started fellowship in 2013, so our chief year, and it's certainly been an absolute blessing um, having him along for the, for the ride. Um, he's currently eight years old. And so I've been performing gender affirming surgery now for um, since 2014, um, originally working with um, a surgeon um, by the name of Dr. Curtis Crane. Um, and he taught me a lot of the aspects of gender surgery, particularly with vaginal plasty. And then I wanted to form my own practice called Align Surgical Associates in 2018. Um, Dr. Angela Rodriguez did her craniofacial fellowship here at Stanford and then Dr. Dave Rajala did his microsurgery fellowship here in 2013. He's uh, kind of spearheading our phalloplasty program, and we perform all aspects um, among all of us um, of gender affirming surgery. And I'm definitely fortunate to say that we have two other surgeons who will be joining us um, in the coming uh, coming year. So another story. I recall when I was a, a senior resident um, in hand clinic, and Dr. Jim Chang is a very busy clinic, and so we had a little bit of a downtime. And he turned to me and he said, um, "Thomas, you're so brave for being so open about who you are." So I was touched, um, but I was also taken aback because Dr. Chang um, is not normally inclined to be you know, sentimental. Um, but as I thought about it, um, I've actually been fairly fortunate. And the negative encounters I've had really don't compare to what trans individuals are about to go through. So I truly believe that the transgender community is brave. The 53 transgender people who are on this slide who were murdered last year are brave. The patients who come to my office are brave because they're the ones who have had to fight not just for their rights, but for their very lives. And every day I have to remind myself the people, the transgender people who walk through my door are the ones who survived. They're the ones who didn't succumb to homicide or suicide, which is so pervasive in this community. So there's definitely an increase in visibility. So in the media, we have Elliot Page, Laverne Cox, Caitlyn Jenner, but really there's still a lack of education. So only 15% of Americans say they know someone who's trans and with a lack of familiarity and the lack of education comes intolerance, discrimination, and of course, violence. And so there's actually been this huge increase in violence and murders of trans people over the years. And the vast majority of victims are trans women of color. So primarily African-American. And I myself have had a patient who was murdered um, and she was an African-American trans woman several years ago. I've also been on the receiving end of hate mail over the years. So I've received homophobic correspondence in the mail. We've had angry people come into our office on two separate occasions and threaten our staff. Um, we keep our office locked. Um, people have to be buzzed in. We have cameras and everyone in our office actually carries mace with them for their protection. So I had another mailing here and this included pages and pages of articles disproving quote unquote the benefits of gender affirming surgery, essentially saying that we've taken away the rights of trans patients by forcing these operations on them. And that medical institutions, including the World Health Organization, the American um, uh, Academy of Pediatrics, the Endocrine Society, have all broken away from the traditional standards set by rigorously developed medical ethics and the scientific method, which of course is not the case because rigorous scientific endeavors have always shown the benefits of gender affirming surgery. So this is an in-depth meta-analysis done recently at Cornell, which highlights 72 articles which show the medical and psychosocial benefits of gender affirming surgery. And this is a recent paper in JAMA that looked at over 27,000 patients and showed that surgery improved mental health outcomes. And given the clear health benefits, many national and international organizations support gender care and have explicit statements to that effect. The other thing um, that's brought up is a concern for regret as a counter argument against surgery. However, there is a recent meta-analysis in PRS um, which shows that the regret rate is less than 1%. And this is drastically lower, if you think about it, than the 65% regret rate that can sometimes be seen among patients who've had cosmetic surgery. And there's also a two to three times increased suicide rate among uh, cisgender women 
who undergo breast augmentation, but by no means, especially for me as a plastic surgeon, am I opposed to cosmetic surgery? That's not the point. However, gender affirming care is held to a completely different standard uh, to other uh, surgical uh, procedures. But I wanted to move on to, to terminology and give you a background here. So gender dysphoria is derived from the Greek word dysphoros, which means hard or difficult to bear. So this is a distress that's caused by a discrepancy between a person's gender identity and that person's sex assigned at birth. The indications for surgery or for treatment of gender dysphoria, and one thing that you have to keep in mind, just because someone is, is transgender doesn't necessarily mean that they have gender dysphoria. So if you're transgender, it doesn't always mean that you necessarily need to be on hormones and need to move forward with surgery. So it's about achieving congruency, attaining positive, just overall well-being, engaging in meaningful relationships. And for a lot of my patients, particularly for minority patients, it's a huge, huge issue of safety. Um, I like this slide, which breaks down the different components of gender and sex, which are independent of each other, okay? So gender identity is how the individual sees their gender, how they identify, regardless of how they look. Um, so they identify as either male or female or in between, so non-binary, genderqueer. Gender expression is how you express yourself, so in a masculine fashion, in a feminine fashion, or an androgynous fashion. Biological sex, of course, pertains to the organs that you have, and then sexual orientation to whom you're attracted. And all of these, once again, are independent factors. It's important for us to think of gender not as binary, but as a spectrum. So every other aspect of us as humans is on a spectrum. So we should think of um, gender in the same way. Um, and then in terms of the words that we use, it, it is changing and evolving. So for someone who is transitioning to a more feminine um, um, uh, gender expression, I suppose, the appropriate term to use now is actually trans woman as opposed to male to female, okay? It's the same thing with trans man which also implies female to male. You'll see this in the literature, um, you know, female to male or male to female, but it's more appropriate to use trans woman or trans man. Um, not to be used transgendered, um, transsexual or transvestite. And then for someone who's non-transgender, you can say non-transgender or cisgender. And in terms of the terminology that's out there, patients are constantly teaching me. So I'm constantly learning, keeping an open mind. So non-binary, gender fluid, gender neutral, but I think all inclusive terminology would include gender diverse or gender um, expansive. Um, and then also in terms of surgery, once again, the more appropriate terminology we're moving away or not using gender reassignment or sex reassignment, but gender affirmation or gender um, affirming or confirmation surgery, because once the, again, the gender is already defined, right? We're not changing the gender, but we're changing the outward appearance to match um, the patient's um, gender. Different types of pronouns, majority of my patients identify in a binary fashion, either she or he, um, non-binary patients, they, and there's a couple of other uh, pronouns that have been brought up, but rarely over the years we've seen those. And, you know, if you have, uh, if you're not sure, you can always ask. And patients, I found are never insulted by that. I think they appreciate it. I know they appreciate it. So what name do you prefer? What is your gender? What are your pronouns? I, um, I remember it was a couple of years ago at a conference, I was a guest speaker. And um, several of my surgical colleagues told me that um, this whole idea of pronouns was just absolutely ridiculous. We just flat out said that um, in a crowded audience and that our job as doctors is to educate patients and redirect them to reality. Um, allowing patients to choose their gender and pronouns is equivalent to accommodating the delusions of a schizophrenic patient. That's what I was told. And so using someone's correct personal pronouns is a way to respect them. Um, and that creates an inclusive environment, just as using a person's name can be a way to show respect. 0.8, so 0.8% of the US population identifies as transgender as far as we know, so that's about 1.4 million adults. Varies by state and country and geographical region, and also varies by age. And so 20% of childhood gender dysphoria um, eventually does continue into adulthood, but most, most doesn't. Um, etiology, multifactorial, just like every other aspect of um, human existence. Dr. Benjamin, um, was one of the early pioneers in gender affirming care um, uh, with hormones and with surgery. He wrote the transsexual phenomenon and that helped in many ways, once again, to legitimize um, gender affirmation care. He created WPATH, the World Professional Association of Transgender Health. It's a multidisciplinary professional association which creates the appropriate you know, guidelines for moving forward with gender care. And so I closely follow um, the standards of care. This is version seven, version eight will be coming out later this year. 
that lays out once again, the very strict, um, for the most part guidelines um, that we should follow and the requirements that patients should meet before moving forward with either hormones or with surgery. The process of transitioning is not linear, but in general, it starts out with coming out. Um, so once again, coming out to yourself, coming out to people around you that you are transgender and it can happen at any age. Um, therapy, living as your desired gender, hormone therapy, and then at the very end, surgery. And once again, um, it's not linear. And as a plastic surgeon, I think of myself as kind of the caboose on the train ride along this journey of the transition. Uh, because by the time patients come to my clinic, they've already you know, had multidisciplinary evaluation and have been, I suppose, appropriately prepackaged before they um, move forward with any type of surgical consideration. And what's important to keep in mind is that gender dysphoria or gender identity disorder, as it's listed in ICD-10, is based on DSM-5 criteria. It's not a psychiatric disorder. That's the one thing that we have to keep in mind. But mental health professionals are involved. Why are they involved? because they assess and they diagnose gender dysphoria. And then they refer patients um, to get appropriate um, hormonal treatment, surgical treatment. And they also help with a lot of coping mechanisms and also help with associated comorbidities that patients might have, such as depression or anxiety. Gender affirming surgery is covered by insurance in only 25 states. And fortunately, fortunately we do have it here in California. And even in states where there is insurance coverage, the process can be extremely confusing and administratively demanding. So in my office, I have at least you know, four or five people who are devoted just to the finances and insurance. And while cost of individual operations uh, may be expensive, the overall cost for our healthcare system is minimal. And so more so overall healthcare expenditure for trans patients decreased since patients had less overall healthcare issues such as mental health, suicidality, and drugs. And we also, the other thing that I wanted to touch upon is we need to improve medical education to help improve the health of transgender and LGBT patients. And so in a landmark paper, this was in JAMA, this was by uh, Dr. Obed and Maliver and Dr. Mitch Lund, who are both here at, at Stanford. Um, US schools spent only about five hours providing LGBT related education. This was in 2011, but even more recently, you know, it hasn't changed too drastically. About 76% of schools included some type of LGBT health themes. And usually they're just small lectures and group discussions, 80%. Um, didn't feel competent at treating sexual and gender minority patients. And 50% of transgender people reported having to teach their healthcare providers and 25% of transgender people didn't, were denied healthcare. And so LGBT health education um, is needed to reduce health disparities and provide optimal care. So it's not about changing personal, cultural, or religious views about sexual orientation or gender identity. And negative experiences wealth with the healthcare, healthcare system affect not just gender related care, but worse than all other um, healthcare um, health aspect measures for trans women as well as for trans men. And you know these are kind of important facts and just basic facts to keep in mind that so many of the transgender patients, 29% live in poverty, 50% can't afford insurance, 41% of attempts in suicide, 50% of experienced some type of sexual abuse and the average life expectancy, particularly for a trans woman of color, an African-American trans woman of color is 32 years. Minors. Let's touch upon this very briefly. So I think a lot of um, individuals view the treatment of minors as controversial. I, however, don't think that should be the case. So one recent study has found that almost 10% of teenagers identified as transgender or non-binary, gender diverse. So it's not clear how this translates into gender dysphoria or um, the need for gender affirming care, but this does highlight the need to understand and support an ever increasing gender expansive population. And just recently, I think many, some of you might be aware, the Parental Rights and Education Bill was passed in Florida. And so under this legislation, LGBT related lessons uh, can't occur, may not occur in kindergarten through grade three. And so the bill would also allow parents uh, to sue schools or teachers that engage um, in these topics. And so I truly believe that this bill takes away um, the safe space for LGBT kids and for LGBT parents like me. So kids know at a very young age if they're gay or transgender or gender diverse. And I knew I was gay by the time I was five. And I've had parents tell me their kids are transgender at the age of three. And I even had one parent who told me that their child attempted suicide at the age of eight because of constant bullying. So that's why having a curriculum in these early grades is so important. Okay, and just recently, Texas Governor Greg Abbott ordered um, the state that the state child welfare agency investigate and prosecute parents and medical providers who allow their children to undergo gender affirming 
care, including hormones or surgery, because this was equated to child abuse. And because of this, unfortunately, Texas Children's Hospital, which is the largest you know, hospital, pediatric hospital um, in the country, announced it would be um, stopping its gender affirming care to those under 18 uh, because they are concerned of criminal legal ramifications. I truly, truly believe that politics and religion should be separate from how we practice medicine. And so what I want people to know and understand is that I'm not a renegade surgeon. So I'm not shooting from the hip and making rash decisions. I'm not you know, forcing my agenda on anyone. I'm not indoctrinating anyone into my lifestyle. I'm not coercing anyone, particularly minors um, into surgery, okay? So I'm a doctor who relies on research, on empiric data to make my decisions. And while I always keep in mind thoughtfulness and compassion, and everyone should be considered, I believe, on a case-by-case -case basis when you're taking care of them. So I won't operate on a patient, uh, particularly a minor, um, unless they have a truly, truly compelling case and a lot of support. And for vaginoplasty, the youngest I'll operate on is 17. For top surgery, I'll consider any age, but it's still very, very rare for me to operate on anyone younger than the age of uh, 16. Um, the Endocrine Society and many other medical organizations support hormones and gender affirming surgery for those under the age of 18. The Netherlands has done extensive long-term research and they've shown that adolescents um, also benefit from hormonal and surgical intervention and no one in their cohort expressed any regret post-op. This study that was in JAMA a couple of years ago followed patients between the ages of 13 and 25 and showed they had significant improvement in their dysphoria compared to those who didn't have surgical care and once again, with no regret among the minors. So at that point, at this point, um, after all of that um, heavy stuff, I'd like to actually dive into surgery, okay? So um, I do perform all aspects of gender affirming surgery, um, except phalloplasty. And once again, my surgical colleague, Dr. Grijala, um, specializes um, in that. Let's start up with vaginoplasty. So I do a fair number of vaginoplasties, probably done about 800 or so over the past eight years. There are three different types, penile inversion, peritoneum, or bowel. Um, I do um, only penile inversion vaginoplasty, which is what most um, surgeons in the United States and world do. Using peritoneum and bowel, I think is more so for individuals who have had a failed penile inversion vaginoplasty, or if they're dealing with a patient who has minimal uh, genital tissue to work with. Once again, following the standards of care, patients do need two mental health letters um, in full support, um, certainly moving forward. Um, uh, with, uh, with an operation. So once again, heavily evaluated. Um, strong social support is very important for patients to move forward. So I like to think of our patients, you know, it's analogous to, you know, um, a kid who's having major craniofacial surgery or someone who's having organ transplantation you need to have strong multidisciplinary support and social support before moving forward to ensure success. The ideal vagina Natural, convincing, minimal upkeep, engaging in sexual intercourse, erogenous lubrication is one thing that I can't attain with the penile inversion vaginoplasty. These are the anatomic components that I tried to create. And I just wanted to go through some diagrams of the operation itself. So the initial part of the operation is performing the orchiectomy. Um, and then I also remove the scrotal skin, which is subsequently gonna be used for lining of the vagina. Uh, the next part is actually separating the components um, of the uh, phallus and then maintaining um, the uh, penile uh, skin flap. Um, and then I separate the glands with this associated neurovascular bundle um, and maintain that. Um, the urethra is separated, shortened, brought down to the perineum, so in a more feminine position, and then I remove the erectile tissue, uh, no longer needed um, at that point. And then the glands itself, um, I uh, decrease the size of it, so reduce it by about 80, 90%, create the clitoris, and then place it in the correct anatomic location on the pubic center. And then the scrotal skin, um, I uh, suture it to the distal aspect of the penile shaft flap, and then I place it into the pelvic cavity. Average depth is about 15 centimeters, um, and then inset um, the rest of the vagina. And so these are immediate post-operative results that you can see here, and these are long-term results. Uh, results. So these are one year post op variety of results, and it's going to be dependent, of course, on you know the patient's age, um, their BMI, skin quality. Now, this is one of my oldest patients. She was about seventy five years old. 
Um, patients do well, they stay with us for about two days. Um, if they're from out of town, they usually stay in the Bay Area for about a month. Um, Post-operative compliance is important. Lifelong dilation is gonna be an important component. So that's why it's important to assess patients to make sure they have appropriate compliance and support in that post-operative care. I tell all of our patients, the operations, the easy parts of post-operative care that can be difficult. Patients typically do well. Um, by three months, they're usually back to their baseline and back to normal activities. So I took it upon myself to um, you know, look at my uh, outcomes retrospectively. This was my first two years of, of practice. Um, and I published this paper in 2018 in PRS. It's about 117 patients um, that I looked at, um, primarily healthy, um, average age was about 30, 38 years old. Um, not surprisingly, 41% of patients had some type of mental health issue. Um, what are the post-operative complications? So most of them were minor. There was about a 50% complication rate. But granted, these were minor complications of granulation tissue, some degree of scar tissue. Major complications were rare, such as um, prolapse or rectal injury or urethral injury. Postoperative distress can happen with some patients. I equate it to postpartum depression. So having strong, once again, mental support is important. And I've also worked to optimize techniques during revisions, which about 24% of patients do need. This was a follow-up pa uh, paper that was uh, published in 2019. And this kind of shows a, the technique that I, that I use for um, a more formal labiaplasty. And this highlights kind of the improvements that can be made uh, with the formal labiaplasty for a patient who had a prior penile inversion of vaginoplasty. I've also you know, talked about using fat grafting as an adjunct for some patients uh, for vaginoplasty, which has been very helpful. So are patients satisfied? They are. 94% um, of my patients feel positively um, afterwards, 75% were satisfied with their sexual function, 77% were able to achieve an orgasm, 71% had a resolution of the dysphoria, 93% would do it again, 94% are happier after the operation than they were before the operation. And so factors that negatively affect patient satisfaction, so having a complication, not surprisingly, or having a history of physical abuse or a suicide attempt. Um, so facial gender affirming surgery, just really quickly, your face is the window to the world. So this is something that one of my and for a lot of my patients who come in, they typically want you know, all aspects of gender affirming surgery. So face, breast, body, vaginoplasty, but a good number of them actually wanna start with their face because that is what, once again, the world sees. Um, and based on our own eye gaze um, studies, which I did in conjunction with uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Nazar Ali, um, we know it only takes a fraction of a second for anyone to identify, identify a face as either masculine or feminine. And the parts of the face that are viewed as being masculine are typically the brow and the chin and the jaw. So those are the areas that I tend to, I tend to highlight. This, these are kind of caricatures that show, you know, what a feminine and what a masculine face looks like. So once again, a more prominent brow, bigger nose, bigger chin and jaw. These are the areas that I really want to address as well as the Adam's apple. I um, certainly want to ensure safety. My primary focus, you know, among, you know, everything that I look at in the evaluation is their goals and wishes. So not everyone who comes in wanting facial feminization surgery wants every aspect of their face um, addressed. Some are very focused just on their chin or just their nose. So I'm not gonna be one who's gonna force a procedure on someone if it's not something that they, that they bring up. Um, and multiple procedures, and I'll just go through some um, intraoperative pictures of, of what I do. So for the upper third of the face, hairline advancement, frontal sinus setback, forehead contouring, and open brow lift are the big, big things that we typically do. I use a coronal incision. Uh, this is a patient preoperatively and then intraoperatively, you know, starting off with the um, uh, uh, hairline incision here. And once again, a coronal incision, dissect, uh, dissecting a subperiosteal plane. And this highlights kind of the areas of the orbits that I want to contour and open up to create a more uh, feminine appearance. For someone who's got small airspace and a large bony um, anterior table, I can get away with just burring that area and creating a nice, forehead contour, but for someone who's got a large airspace in the frontal sinus region, very thin anterior table, uh, then I have to do a more formal um, osteotomy um, of that anterior table. Here's a frontal sinus, here's the bony plate, recess it, and then using um, titanium plates to hold it into place. And then I use some bone dust to fill in those crevices. Uh, place tunnels, unicortical tunnels. These are these purple uh, sutures or PDS that I use as part of the brow lift. So the patient's left has been elevated and now the right. 
And then I um, do a hairline advancement for a fair number of our patients as well to shorten the distance between the brow and the hairline. Um, and so got a good amount of advancement, about two centimeters um, in this case, um, remove the extra skin. So now have a forehead height of about four centimeters. And we had started off with about six or six or seven. So before and immediate after, another before and immediate after. And then you can see how the hairline does heal quite well over time. Um, and this is a before and after for a patient who had forehead contouring and brow lift. And you can also see, I mean, you can definitely see how the hooding has gone away. You can definitely see more of a canthal tilt of the eyes as well, which is a very feminine trait um, that you want to have. And it, once again, it's still her face, but it's a more feminine version of her face. The lower third of the face, so genioplasty and mandible contouring, the goal is to decrease the size. Lots of different approaches and techniques that can be done. Um, a sliding genius osseous, uh, genius, um, um, uh, osseous genioplasty um, really is um, a very useful, versatile tool that can be used. So really quickly, once again, intraoperative view of a subperiosteal dissection, keeping those mental nerves out of harm's way. Um, and in this case, I removed that a one centimeter segment, midline segment for a T osteotomy that was performed. So then I perform my osteotomy uh, using a reciprocating blade and then basically collapse those two pieces together, effectively decreasing the width. And I took out a sliver of bone in the, um, as well to decrease the, uh, the vertical height. So then I contour the entirety of the mandible as well to uh, decrease the width. For some of my patients, um, rather than doing you know, a genioplasty, I can just do what's called an ostectomy, just removing the lower border um, uh, bony aspects to uh, create a more uh, tapered chin. I'm a huge fan of Sonapet. Maybe some of you have used this for, it's, ultra, it's an ultrasonic device that really um, uh, minimizes soft tissue trauma and then resuspending the metallus muscle. Uh, trade shaver chondral laryngoplasty, a good number of my patients do this. Um, and so it's important, of course, to keep the vocal cords out of harm's way when doing this, but it's the upper third of the Adam's apple or the thyroid cartilage that I take down, which can make a huge difference for patients before and after. For a lot of our patients, this is sometimes the only procedure that they, that they want, so before and after. And then the middle third of the face, so a rhinoplasty, and the goal is to reduce the size of the nose. So shorten the nose, reducing the dorsal hump, increasing tip rotation. And then a lip lift is also another popular procedure. So reducing the height between the nose and the upper lip. Cheek augmentation, lots of different things. I'm a big fan of fat transfer. So this is a patient before and then after. And I fat transferred a fair amount of fat um, actually into her uh, cheeks and her lips. Non-surgical approaches can be uh, used as well. This patient, I actually injected Botox in her masseter muscles, um, 25 units on either side, and that decreased uh, the bulk that she had there and created a more from Patients do well, they usually stay with us overnight and then they're, they're able to leave. And I just wanted to show this transition process for one of my patients. So early on pre-transition, so she had been in the Marines, hypermasculine, started her transition. This was like, you know, a couple months after transition, there's about a year or so, um, right after her operation, one week, three months, and then one year. So she sent me this uh, uh, picture herself. And I just wanted to cycle through some of my patients. This patient just had her lower face um, that was modified to so a genioplasty and then a mandible contouring. And you can see the huge difference it makes in the overall appearance of her face, even though I only targeted the lower aspect of her face. And this is all of these patients are full facial feminization. And the big question that patients bring up is, um, is it gonna change you know, who I am? No, it doesn't. Once again, it's still your face, but a more feminine version of your face. This patient sent me these pictures really before and really after um, her uh, transition. And I've also done her breast augmentation and then also body feminization and uh, vaginoplasty. She had a concomitant or she had a, a staged facelift as well. One of my more recent patients here. And patients do well. The biggest concerns are scarring, temporary alopecia, but otherwise patients do quite, quite well. In terms of patient satisfaction, um, we did a review, a systematic review in 2016. Uh, wasn't much out in the literature at that point. And since then, I've done a long-term perspective international study. I did it in conjunction with um, a facial team in Spain. And we looked at patients over time prospectively. We used a validated questionnaire. And ultimately what we found was that patients had a positive change in their self-perception, right? So this is 
so far as I know, the only prospective study that, is, that has shown this. Um, and we found that factors that are associated with negative outcomes is usually age, which is not surprising because once you have the decrease of your bony structures, it can lead to soft tissue um, jowling. So a lot of these patients do need uh, facelifts later down the line, which I uh, described. Um, this was in clinics in 2018, and then a subsequent paper that was I, uh, published with Dr. Uh, Rockwin. She was um, here as a resident, um, and she is now at NYU doing craniofacial surgery. And I, this shows, once again, that facelift should also be considered as a component um, of facial feminization surgery for older patients. And then facial gender um, surgery, um, you know, should be considered, once again, as something that's uh, considered from an insurance standpoint, I wrote this um, consensus guideline with a group of other surgeons nationally and internationally um, just recently. Um, breast augmentation, just really, really quickly here. And so one mental health letter for patients can be challenging given the body habitus of patients. Lots of options, which I won't go into, but I primarily do an inframammary fold incision, submuscular under the muscle. Most patients have very minimal breast tissue. Um, so this is the approach that I need to, to take in order to, to, to conceal the implant. And I tend to use a silicone implant. So before my markings and then immediate after. Patients do well. Um, and these are examples of breast augmentation. Um, tissue expansion and fat grafting can be done. Uh, typically, I don't. Um, fat grafting, the gains are quite minimal. So we reviewed our patients, um, did this in conjunction with Dr. Miller, who's a chief resident on here in plastics, and showed that patients were happy. More than 90% of patients were quite happy. And then, of course, minimal complications. The biggest concern is unhappy with size. Most patients want to be a bit bigger, um, but we are limited because they have a very, very tight pocket um, that we're working with. So some patients sometimes have to come back to get revisions later down the line. Body contouring, um, we're starting to see a bit more of this um, over the coming year, year and a half. I think there are more societal influences, increasing insurance coverage. Um, not Insurance isn't covering at this point. It may change over the years, and we're still establishing the appropriate guidelines. The female body tends to have more body fat in general, about 10%. It's distributed more in the hips and butt, and so that's what I'm striving to um, achieve. Um, one thing that I wanted to uh, touch upon is that if you have any transgender patients who are telling you that they're going to go to Mexico or Florida, they get silicone injected into their butt or hips, tell them not to do that because this is what happens. This is a patient who came back to, came back to me with this uh, particular issue. The, the goal for body feminization is to create that, that classical hourglass um, figure. Um, and it's important to set appropriate expectations. So if someone's coming in with this picture, I had a lot of patients too. I tell them that I'm not going to be able to achieve this. I had a patient come in and said, this is what she wanted to look like post-op. This is what she looked like pre-op. And I had to counsel her heavily that this was not going to be the case. ASPS does have a gluteal fat uh, grafting advisory board because there have been um, certainly concerns about death from fat emboli, but certainly with a safe technique, it's not um, an issue. And then examples of patients who have had um, body contouring. And you can see that it makes a huge difference uh, for them. Um, top surgery, let me just go through this. So patients need one mental health, and I do a fair number of mastectomies. Um, and I think more and more surgeons who are entering the uh, gender-affirming surgical field typically start off with mastectomies. So one mental health letter, the goal is to create a masculine trust in most cases, although I'm seeing more and more variations that people are asking for. Um, in terms of how they want their chest to look like. So some patients even asking for no nipples or um, having their incisions oriented in different ways. Um, I don't have BMI cutoffs for top surgery patients. I find that the complication profile is low. So as long as they're healthy, um, I'm okay. And the highest BMI I've actually operated on was 53. Patients oftentimes wear um, binders and changes the quality of the skin. And patients are very well informed when they come in. Lots of different surgical techniques. I primarily perform what's called a double incision, which is a standard mastectomy. So removing the tissue and then using the nipple and the areola as a skin graft. Um, so uh, standard preoperative markings, intraoperatively, once again, taking out the nipple and the areola as a skin graft and placing it back on in a more masculine position. I keep patients in binders. I don't use drains typically. This is before and then immediately uh, post-op for this patient. 
Uh, this is at two months. Uh, this is another patient at three months and then one year. And I show this to all my patients so that you can see the evolution of wound healing. It takes time. This patient's three months. This is six months. Um, and this is one year post-op. Can also maintain a dermaglandular pedicle um, to maintain sensation, which some patients do ask for. Um, the issue with this is that you tend to have a little bit of um, extra bulk that's left. And then a keyhole or a subcutaneous mastectomy is reserved for those who tend to be on the very small side and young and have good quality skin. So it's a small periareolar um, um, incision that I make, um, and I don't do anything with the, the skin or the areola uh, before and after when you're post-op. And then nipple resizing is important for a lot of patients can be done at the same time, um, or it can be uh, staged as in uh, this case. And then patients do well, complication profile is really low. The biggest concerns are typically revisions for patients who are uh, on the obese side. And then also hypertrophic scarring and this patient had hypopigmented uh, nipples, so we actually tattooed it, uh, the area. So, okay, I just wanted to end really quickly here. Um, so what can I do to help, right? So after going through all of this, um, I'd like to provide ways in which all of us can find ways to help, um, either if you're part of the LGBT community or if you're an ally. I think first and foremost, acknowledge the community um, and acknowledge your experiences, recognize and celebrate the annual International Trans Day of Visibility it's on March 31st. That's going to be coming up soon. Commemorate those who have been lost with the annual Trans Day of Remembrance. So this is in uh, November 20th. There are events throughout the Bay Area. I think it's important to assess your own biases, right? So I have to assess my own biases. So if I see like a white man wearing a cowboy hat driving a pickup truck, I can't assume that he's racist and homophobic, right? That's very unfair of me to make that kind of judgment of him. So I think all of us need to be able to assess our own biases. Consistently use modifiers for all patients, right? Not just for transgender people, but for also cisgender people, right? And then don't make assumptions. In your own office and work environment, uh, foster diversity and inclusivity at statements um, that are non-discriminatory, um, create an office environment that's welcoming. And so I have intake paperwork that asks about you know, your preferred pronoun, your preferred um, or your um, current gender identity. And there should be an option where you um, decline to state, right? It's also great that the American College of Surgeons, um, American um, uh, Association of American Colleges also includes in the application um, whether you want to include like your gender identity um, or your sexual orientation. And then Harvard Medical School's application also has this, and I know other institutions have also followed, and this definitely goes a long way to including inclusivity. Engage in research, advocacy, leadership, fundraising, donating. I'm involved in the Pride Committee, Pride Committee in um, ASPS, uh, which was um, uh, created um, about a year and a half or so ago, and then also heavily involved in WPAD. Um, engage in recruitment, um, I think it's great that that Stanford has definitely, you know, uh, taken this upon itself to really improve um, diversity, equity, inclusion, and transgender health with the pediatric clinic, uh, with the um, Jedi diversity, equity, and inclusion, which is um, headed by Dr. Ren and Dr. Esquivel, um, and just wonderful progress has been made. The Pride study here at Stanford, um, UCSF has great resources, AAMC. Lots of different conferences here in uh, San, uh, in the Bay Area and also in California that you can go to refer patients to, WPATH, several books um, that you can also look at. So lots of resources. So I think in, in closing, I think for any of us who are part of the LGBT community or any other underrepresented group, I think it's a responsibility to be visible. Um, and sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's tiring, sometimes it's exhausting, but we need to represent our patients. And patients need to see people like us to understand that doctors come in all different um, types. Um, and I think by being visible and being appropriately represented in the world of medicine, we normalize our differences, um, which leads to understanding, compassion, and ultimately leading to a better care for all of our patients. So as I reflect back on that attending 12 years ago in the OR, um, who said I should feel ashamed. I, I certainly don't. So I have nothing but pride. So I'm proud to be Black. I'm proud to be Filipino. I am proud um, to be gay. And I'm certainly proud to serve the transgender community. So it's been an absolute pleasure and honor to be here today. But thank you, everyone.